What's up, everybody? Welcome to Classic Movie Gush. I'm Clay Morgan, and here with Melissa Tag, as always. How are you, Melissa? I'm awesome. How about you? I am doing <laughs> well. You're excited because you've been putting the wraps on a story of your own, aren't you? Yes, it's going to be done tonight, I think, I hope, if I stay awake. Yeah, it is It is hard work writing stories, isn't it? Yeah, like crazy hard work. So I can really appreciate when somebody writes a great story. and oh, Great segue. <laughs> and... Uh, so did Hollywood with the movie that we're talking about tonight. And the movie is Citizen Kane, often considered yes. by many critics the greatest movie ever made. Ever, and interestingly, ever. it only won one Academy Award, and that was for Best Original Screenplay. So let us get to the bottom of, first of all, why do people hold this movie in such high regard and do we agree might be something we haven't talked about yet. We have to figure out. Um, so Citizen Kane, what can you tell me about it? <laughs> I can tell you a lot about it. Well, oh. it's by Orson Welles. And, okay, Orson Welles was only 24 when he made this movie. And it, I think it was like 25 or 26 when it came out. That's crazy, 24 which is also the best television show ever. But anyway... Wow, whoa, 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 <laughs> best ever? You just dropped that 24 is the best television show ever and we're trying to talk about Citizen Kane? Well, that's really good. I love it. That's a whole other <laughs> Jack podcast. Bauer? It's coming back next year, too, it in is. the spring. Yes, everybody needs <laughs> to know this. So anyway... <laughs> Sidebar Citizen over. Kane... <laughs> well, I'm happy to talk about 24 more if you want to, <laughs> Orson Welles made his name uh, in stage and radio work. Very famously, he did War of the Worlds. Yep. And I guess we should explain who Orson Welles is because it's not like oh, yeah. there's this huge I just catalog. That everybody knew. <laughs> there's, it's not like there's this huge catalog of movies where we're going to be talking about the works of Orson Welles. Um, and that's one of the reasons I think this movie has the impact that it has. And so Orson Welles did make his uh, name in radio. He famously did the War of the Worlds radio broadcast, and people were, like, freaking out. They really thought this alien invasion had happened, right? Mm -hmm. um, what a great voice. Don't you just love his voice? He has a really distinctive baritone voice, yes. Yeah, and I think it has a great radio voice. <clears throat> and that's, that's one of the reasons I think he's convincing in this um, wide span of years, really from, mm -hmm. what, early 20s through deathbed is the yeah. span of the character. So Charles Foster mm -hmm. Kane is the title character, Citizen Kane, based on the life of William Randolph Hearst, who was a powerful media mogul um, in real life who challenged Joseph Pulitzer's New York newspaper and created sensationalist journalism. And really, mm -hmm. he became so powerful that 44, 45 million people a day were reading his newspapers. Whoa. Did you know that's that? That's a lot of people. That's a lot I didn't of know that. people. That's, that's new to me. <laughs> And uh, I don't think Wells knew just who he was messing with because this movie was not very popular with no. Mr. Hurst. No, it's amazing that everybody... I mean, it's amazing that it's still around today because it didn't even yeah. open in that many theaters. Hurst tried to ban it. There were protests. It's kind of crazy. You know what I heard Robert Osborne say once on TMC? That um, hmm. Hurst actually offered... RKO, a huge payment to destroy all the negatives before the film even came out. Yeah, he did, and um, all the, the other major studios all banded together and also offered like a huge sum of money. They offered the cost of making the film if they would destroy the film and everything. RKO said no, and they were probably very happy that they did. Yeah, and Hearst, uh, him and his... Mm, what do you call her? Mistress Marion Davies, the oh, actress yeah. Marion Davies. They had like <laughs> legendary parties. There were always famous celebrities um, there, so they certainly had connections for a long time. And uh, you, they weren't even permitted. Any Hearst paper wasn't even permitted to have an ad uh, or anything mm -hmm. that mentioned Orson Welles. They, they just kind of ignored him um, mm -hmm. it was as if he didn't even exist. So 
it, there's like this whole backstory yeah. I think that adds to mm-hmm. the impact of yeah. the film. Um, and it's interesting who's in the movie, right? This isn't yeah. like your it, cast of stars. No, these aren't like normal studio era Hollywood actors and actresses. They're all um, Orson Welles was uh, before he was actually on radio. He was a stage actor, and he had a group called the Mercury the- uh, Mercury Theater, mm-hmm. and they did stage productions. They did radio, and he basically took that whole troupe of actors with him to Hollywood. And um, most so most of the people in it are kind of unknowns. Uh, they even at the end of the movie they have in the on the big screen they had something that came up that talked about the Mercury Theater and talked about all these actors and actresses being new to Hollywood. So it's kind of cool. It is uh, that a couple of them became Hollywood mainstays, I I guess. But yeah, so many people who you've never seen, and and that's really for for people who are wondering, okay, why is Citizen Kane considered the greatest movie ever? Which, by the way, is probably one of the most googled questions about cinema ever. People always get probably. assigned this in college. Yeah. They're always wanting to know. I actually have my students uh, looking into this film currently. Yeah. Nice. Um, and I, I think first of all, let's talk about um, artistically. Uh, you you alluded to it. His his mm-hmm. style is so signature. The shots, um, yeah. not just the angles, but the length of the scenes. Mm-hmm. And um, and he had this cinematographer a guy named Greg Toland, who was really a hotshot in the early 1940s. And he used this deep focus that kept every single part of the scene in focus. And there's so many amazing shots where you could be Mm -hmm. watching the action in the foreground, and there's such important stuff happening in the background. It's it's awesome. Um, Do you Mm -hmm. have a particular shot that you just thought was really cool that sticks out in your mind? There's so many signature ones. Oh, yeah, there is. There's one where all they're doing is the camera is going through the roof of a building down onto the table where um, the character of Susan, I think her name is, just is eating a meal. And the whole, the camera moving from basically the sky through the ceiling down to the table is so sweet. And then there's also another one where uh, there's a bunch of singers and dancers. I don't know if it's like a can-can line or something, but there's a bunch of singers kind of in the background doing a song, and the focus is totally on them. But yet, in the foreground, you see um, Citizen Kane and all his people around him, and you, you can actually see what they're saying to each other and what they're doing yeah. while the music is going on. That's really cool. Um, there's one other one that I thought, seriously, somebody needs to use it to teach a class to writers who are writing and needing to learn about how to use symbolism and metaphor. It's a scene where um, uh, Kane and Susan are just fighting. They're in a tent, they're camping, or they're on a picnic or something, and there's all this stuff going on outside the tent, and they kind of shoot back and forth. Sometimes you see what's going on outside, and sometimes you're back inside the tent where Kane and Susan are arguing with each other. And um, like yeah. the song that is going on, the lyrics of the song that is playing at this big camping party or whatever it is, the lyrics of it match perfectly with what they're talking about in the tent. There's screams that are going on in the background of people partying, and 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 they're perfectly timed to what they're talking about. I mean, the whole scene is just a masterpiece, really, and that was the thing that kept blowing me away. I was like, dude, he didn't, he didn't get lazy even once. Every single scene is has that same kind of amazingness to it. It was really cool. He was known as a real... I don't know if you want to say dictatorial director, like the stuff he did to his stage actors. He was a harsh, yeah. harsh man to work for, um, but he was a prodigy. And uh, one of the scenes I was thinking of is when his good friend has finally, his good friend Leland, who came into the newspaper business with him, has finally just basically given up. And yeah. um, there's this shot where in the extreme foreground, uh, Kane is at the typewriter finishing an article and Leland is yeah. kind of entering the shot from his office, and uh, mm-hmm. man, the the scene just lingers for two or three minutes, mm-hmm. and it's so good. I I I remember the very first time I saw this movie, just being impressed with some of the 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 shots. But you also mentioned the music, right? The use of yeah. audio coming from that radio mm-hmm. background. Uh, everything about this film was so different than what was happening in Hollywood when it was made in 1941. And um, and you're right. He didn't waste a, a movement. He didn't waste a second mm-hmm. in the story. Uh, also, we should add uh, co-written, um, not just by Wells, but the co-writer was Herman Mankiewicz, who also shared that Oscar. Um, mm-hmm. So 
we always do these classic movie gushes, and we start off and we say, so what's the story about? And we kind of we kind of go in a little bit different here, but I think because all of these elements are the story, and when you actually get down yeah. to it, the opening shot basically establishes the mystery that, that the whole film is tracking down. Yeah. <laughs> and we see Cain, he's on his deathbed, and he whispers his last famous word, which is Rosebud. Mm-hmm. And everybody wants to know what Rosebud is. Um, mm-hmm. So when you first saw the movie, did you remember trying to figure it out? Did you remember um, what it was after when you went back to revisit the movie? Did you know what Rosebud was right yeah, away? Yeah, I remembered. I did remember what it was. I think because we had to write something about it in college. Yeah. But I don't remember the first time if I knew. I think I had a sense in the first time because once again at the beginning of the movie. Well, I don't know. Do we want to say what it is? I think like, we have there... to. I think we okay. have. We, <laughs> after after seventy years, we can spoil it. But I think we have to talk okay. about what it okay. means. So Rosebud, at, well, at the beginning of the movie, you see um, Kane as a little kid, and he's outside, and he's sledding in the snow. And basically this one day in his life, the movie kind of insinuates that this one day in his life basically set off the rest of his life, and it's the dark moment in his past when his parents basically gave him away. But he's sledding in the beginning of that scene, and he's happy. And the word Rosebud is on his sled. But you don't um, see so, it when he's a kid. Yeah, you, you don't see it when he's a kid, but then at the very end of the movie, when every, these people that have been trying to figure out what Rosebud means, they've basically just given up. And then it's left to the audience to get to see the sled that is thrown into a fire, and you get to see the word Rosebud on it. And so it's kind of this, oh, okay. So that was basically the one time in his life when he was happy and he felt loved until everything went wrong. It's kind of sad. <laughs> And the reporter says that near the end of the film, you're like, what do you think Rosebud was? Maybe it was something he lost, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and it comes up with, like, innocence and childhood when you see the sled. Mm-hmm. And it's so poignant. There's a, it's a real circular movie because it starts with his death. It ends with his death. And um, I remember the first time I saw it, had no clue what Rosebud was. I wasn't having to write a paper or anything. <laughs> And uh, it really sticks with you, like, oh, it's a sled. Like, it's it's a yeah, sled. Like what is that? It's just a sled. <laughs> um, but it, that's, I think that's why you kind of feel, uh, like you said, it's a little bit of a sad movie because mm-hmm. you see the emptiness of this man's life. Um, mm-hmm. But it, it tells us what Rosebud is. And I was reading this article by Roger Ebert back probably 15 years ago. He wrote this, and uh, he said... Um, Citizen Kane knows the sled is not the answer. It explains what Rosebud is, but not what Rosebud means. The film's construction (laughs) shows how our lives, after we are gone, survive only in the memories of others, and those memories butt up against the walls we erect and the roles we play. I guess that's why he's Roger Ebert. Yeah, that's what I was just thinking. Like... (laughs) (laughs) And and, and that's what this movie shows. Like, here's his friend, right? Here's his... um, Uh, employee and CEO, yeah. uh, chairman of the board. Here's his lover, second wife, and and we're learning mm-hmm. about him through a newsreel in the very beginning, mm-hmm. and then yeah. from these people. Um, so it's just amazing how he tells this this out of order story that really audiences didn't know how to deal with in 1941, from what I've understood. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it didn't it didn't go over well with people. They didn't. They didn't see it for what it was, which is funny. I was thinking about this and thinking, what movies are out there today that we don't get or that we just kind of ignore that in 50 years somebody's yeah. going to say, oh, my goodness, this is a masterpiece. What was wrong with people in 2013 that they didn't understand how amazing this is? But uh, I was thinking the exact yeah. same thing. And I thought a lot, too, about you know, after this movie, Orson Welles. Well, first of all, when Orson Welles was allowed to do this movie, they gave him like a two movie contract. Oh, yeah. They told him they gave him like you can do whatever you want. That is how much first time like, director. A, yeah, yeah, like nobody can do that. And so he was going to get to do whatever he wanted. He pitched one idea, the studio didn't like it. Pitched a second idea, studio didn't like it. Pitched this idea and they were like, "Well, okay." Um, and he made it and it was amazing, but pretty much after that his directing it didn't really go too many places. He ended up going to Europe for a while. He just didn't have 
once he got back in, more into acting, he had more success again. But how would it feel to maybe at 30 feel like you had already hit the pinnacle of your career? That would have had to be, I don't know, that could have been challenging. Yeah, and uh, I was watching, apparently in 1996, they made a documentary. It was actually an American experience documentary called The Battle Over Citizen Kane. Um, mm. I've been able to watch about half of it off and on this week. It, it actually won an Academy Award in its own right for documentary that year. That's and it cool. kind of it kind of parallels the story of these two men and how really this movie was both of their undoing, and that mm. Wells was this okay. huge personality, um, and he was this huge figure in his own right. And it, it's really a a wonderful documentary. I can't wait to finish it. Um, but yeah, I think there is some sadness there in in the fact that um, they said you know there's a reason that Wells got so heavy in his forties and. He just went through drink and um, smoking mm -hmm. and women and all of this stuff. And at the end of every night, they just said he hated himself. There's a sadness That's there. That's sad. I know. I mean, he looks happy <laughs> in his interviews. He I died know. In 19, he died in 1985, by the way, uh, at the age of 70. Um, and there's plenty of interviews of him. He talked about the movie, of course. And it's not like he looked back forever hating Citizen Kane. Um, yeah. But... I think that has a lot to do with when you're ranking the movies. I, I think it's a great film, but that story, mm -hmm. that personal story, the personal cost, kind of puts yeah. this in a, at another level. Yeah, definitely. Now, how do you feel about when when somebody says to you, Melissa, "What is the greatest <laughs> film of all time?" Do do you do you honestly feel that Citizen Kane is there now that you've seen it a second time? Would you? I mean, I, I know uh, what you like, but yeah, that's what about? I was gonna say. I can, I, I don't know if I've seen enough movies to call it the best ever, but honestly, I think of all the movies that I've seen, it's the one that most made me appreciate um, movie making for movie making. I think a lot of times when I'm watching a movie, what I am excited about is the characters or the yeah. dialogue. Story. Or this really great plot, or I love the backstories of golden era actresses and actors, um, and so that's what I get caught up in and what I want to talk about. But when I saw, when I rewatched Citizen Kane, I was like, "There's an art here," and it goes. It honestly, there's more to telling a story than than dialogue and plot. There's all this other stuff that goes into film that makes film a different medium than book writing or you know any other kind of storytelling. So I think from that aspect, yeah. It made somebody like me that honestly doesn't know about all those other things appreciate it, which is what really, that's what great art does, you know. I remember going to the National Gallery in London once and looking at paintings there and being like, I don't know really anything about painting. I don't know what makes these things great. And I'm not even going to be able to talk intelligently about it with a lot of people, but I can say that I know that I'm looking at something that is amazing and that yeah. is a masterpiece. And that's really watching Citizen Kane. That was, that was definitely my reaction this time. Well, well said. That was, that was a long answer to your question. No, it's very, it's very good. I, 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 I have a feeling that this is a movie now that probably as as I get older, I will appreciate more and more. Um, there's just especially the more we watch classic film, it just, yeah. it is so distinct, right? And yeah. um, I should point out that there was a complete moratorium on the mention of Wells' name in all Hearst papers until <laughs> he married Rita Hayworth. Oh yeah, yeah. That became such a big story <laughs> that they had to talk like, about it. Fine, I guess. And I'll uh, him. <laughs> I want to just mention one other thing. Marion Davies, the actress, the the famous actress of the silent era who crossed over into the talkies, um, she was fa very famously the mistress of Hearst. Okay, and yeah. there's a lot of comparisons that the the singer Susan in in Citizen mm -hmm. Kane is her. Um, it's unfortunate because I've watched a couple Marion Davies films, and I I think mm -hmm. she was a brilliant comedian. Unfortunately, Hurst probably hurt her career more than helped, and he always wanted her to do drama. But yeah, um, Orson Welles said, I mean, obviously there's tons of parallels here. There's no sequel to Hurst. <laughs> yeah. But he but he said I never intended to diminish um, oh. Mar Marion Davies that she really was a gifted comedian. He said. Well, that's good. Good yeah. job, Orson. <laughs> because in the in the movie, the singer can't really yeah. sing. But Marion Davies, uh, we're eventually going to do a Marion Davies film. Okay. Uh, we'll have to we'll have to find a good one. 
Yeah. There's there's a couple fun ones, but um, yeah. So interesting, you know, whatever whatever that phrase "life imitates art" means, man, this is somehow <laughs> more intertwined than just <laughs> yeah. about anything else. It really is, because I mean, they're doing a movie that's about Hearst, and actually has pieces of other newspaper magnet lives in it, and and yet it's Orson Welles's life, and then Orson Welles's life after this started to mirror it. I mean, it really is kind of crazy. Yeah. But. A movie that will certainly live on. I'm glad they weren't able to destroy the negatives before it ever hit yeah. the light of day. That would have been sad. Yeah. So, so Citizen Kane. Uh, you know, this was classic movie guest number 10. That's a good round number. We Ooh. had to hit the big Citizen Kane. That's a that's one of the big films. I would like to know if people out there have watched it. Uh, I, I, I bet there's a lot of people who watched it and didn't understand why it was so great, and they haven't yeah. revisited it. I, yeah. I would challenge people to revisit it and give it an honest viewing now. I bet you'll see more than you knew was there the first time. I don't think it's possible to watch this film without seeing more. Yeah, and like I think so often I go to a movie and I, I want to watch it to be entertained and hear a good story and feel happy or something. And this one, I think it really does make a difference if you go into it thinking, I'm going to look at a piece of art right now, and it just changes your viewing experience. That's such a great way to... To sum it up, I totally agree. <laughs> but but it's a good story. I mean, there's there's drama. Yeah, it is. It, there is drama in it. Plenty of it drama. Is, yeah. And poignancy. You will not forget yeah. the last shot. You just won't. No. No. And there's so many so many poignant lines all the way through it. I mean, seriously. So, yeah. So Citizen Kane, classic movie guest number ten. Check it out. Mm -hmm.